So what I'm going to do tonight is talk about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. So last week, I started talking about the first mechanism of action. I talked about how penicillin actually affects cells and how it kills. And I'm going to do that for several more antibiotics today. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk about a general concept here, which is that some antibiotics are so-called bacteriostatic and others are bactericidal. And what that means is shown here. All right. So bactericidal, as the name implies, means they kill. So as you have a growing population, you add the antibiotic, the cells die. That's bactericidal. Bacteriostatic work differently. So cells are growing, you add the antibiotic, and there's no further growth or cell division. So they just stop but they don't actually lice or break open or die. So my first question to get you awake tonight is, if an antibiotic is only bacteriostatic, why do you think it's still useful in treatment of bacterial infections? And you can discuss for 30 seconds about that. So it, it's stopping growth, that's good, so it's not going to get worse. But in addition, you have an immune system. All right, so your immune system is on the lookout for things like bacterial infections and will clean out the bacteria. So even, even if the antibiotic just stops growth, the immune system will take care of the remaining cells that are there. So that's why bacteria static are very useful, as I said here. Stopping growth and division allows the immune system to destroy the remaining bacteria. Okay, so now we're going to talk about different types of antibiotics and how they work. As I said last week, I talked about penicillin affecting the cell wall, and we'll come back to that. But today I want to talk about other antibiotics. So the first antibiotic I want to refer to targets DNA replication. Okay, I showed this slide last week. You have DNA, goes to RNA, goes to protein. We're going to focus up here on DNA. So DNA, when, you, uh, when the bacteria wants to divide and make a new cell, it of course has to copy all its DNA. And it uses an enzyme called DNA polymerase to do that. DNA, as you might recall, is a double-stranded helix which has different base pairs which match together. A always goes with T, adenine always with thymine, cytosine with guanine. The beauty of this molecule is that if you unzip it, like a zipper, then you know that if there is a guanine on the left side here, the uh, replication machinery should put a cytosine in to make a copy. And that's what's happened as shown here, which is a little fuzzy. Here's the existing strand of DNA. It unzips, and DNA polymerase makes a copy of the complementary strand, we call it. So that is what happens. Now, one other thing to know about DNA, in bacteria in particular, is, first of all, bacterial DNA is almost always a circle. In addition, that circle isn't just laying flat like this. It is super coiled. And what that means, it's all twisted up uh, amongst itself. And I'll show you a video in a moment about that. So it gets nicked and wound, so it has a lot of tension in the molecule. And this is very important for a couple of reasons. One is a DNA molecule is huge compared to the size of the bacteria, and they need to fold it up into the right size to even fit in a bacteria. In addition, this gives some energy to the molecule that can be used for other processes like transcription. So uh, those of you who are old enough to remember when we had telephones uh, that were attached to a wall, you remember that they were constantly getting twisted up like this, and you were always unwinding them and things like that. 
This is equivalent to what the DNA does. It gets wound up in a certain way like this. And then there are enzymes which can uh, break the double strand and wind it either more strongly or less strongly. As you remember, this is a closed circle. It can't just swim, uh, move around. Now, when the cell wants to replicate the DNA, it has to unzip this. And you can imagine that if I start unwinding this, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter on this end. And that will stop transcription from happening or replicate, sorry, replication from happening simply because it gets too hard to unwind it. So you need enzymes which go before the DNA polymerase and after it to unwind and loosen that tension ahead or reintroduce the winding on the other side. And the way it does this, it actually cut, the enzyme cuts the double-stranded DNA, unwinds it, and puts it back together. And those enzymes are called topoisomerase. And that's shown here. So topoisomerases are needed to unwind the DNA during DNA replication or to wind it back up. There are, in bacteria, there's another enzyme called gyrase, which works essentially the same as topoisomerase. It's a type of topoisomerase. In addition, when you copy a whole circular piece of DNA like this, at the end of the replication process, you end up with the two strands linked together. So they can't come apart and go into the two cells. And so you need topoisomerase to unlink those two strands. So it's an extremely important enzyme. If you don't have it, the cell cannot divide, basically. One of the antibiotics or classes of antibiotics is called fluoroquinolones. And fluoroquinolones act by blocking DNA gyrase or topoisomerase 2. So what's shown here is the DNA, and here is DNA gyrase. DNA gyrase binds the DNA, and what it's supposed to do is cut, twist, and put it back together. It starts that process by cutting, but a fluoroquinolone like ciprofloxacin binds there and prevents it from putting the DNA strands back together. So in the end, you end up with a double-stranded break in your DNA, in the cell's DNA, and this is usually lethal. So a double-strand break in the DNA means the cell can no longer replicate and live. Fluoroquinolones are a class, as I said, as shown here. This is the chemical structure. I want you to notice in chemical structures, those of you who aren't used to this, an R group means that there are many variations. So, for example, ciprofloxacin, shown here, is a type of fluoroquinolone, and its R group, this one, is shown here. They're named fluoroquinolones because of this F, the fluoride group. Uh, yes. Now, fluoroquinolones act on gyrase and topoisomerases, but later generations of fluoroquinolones have been modified to be able to work primarily on topoisomerase 2 to inhibit daughter strand separation. And these seem to work better in gram-positive bacteria. So in summary, fluoroquinolones block DNA replication. They create double-strand breaks in the DNA, and they can cause mutations in the DNA. They generally lead to bacterial cell death. Okay, now quickly I'm just going to tell you briefly about one other antibiotic which is called rifampicin. So here's our DNA and DNA polymerase. Well, the next step in making, uh, doing protein synthesis is making RNA. And this enzyme here, RNA polymerase, is required to make RNA. 
uh, rifampicin binds RNA polymerase and just stops it. It binds, but then can't do anything. And this is commonly used in the treatment of tuberculosis. The third type is, or general target, is the ribosome. Now, again, we're on the last step now from RNA to protein, and this is the ribosome. There are many, many antibiotics and antibiotic classes that affect the ribosome. They cause it either to simply stop working or to make lots of mistakes in uh, protein synthesis. Some examples are shown here. Now, because this is such a big target, there are so many antibiotics affecting it, I'm going to go into more detail. So this just shows a strand of amino acids, which is what a protein is. And here is, shows how the ribosome actually works. I'm going here. So here's the ribosome. It is reading a messenger RNA, and it does that by looking at the codons here. A codon is three nucleotides. So for example, this one is AAA. Then the ribosome recognizes this. A tRNA, which is a, a molecule which can bring amino acids to the ribosome, brings the correct amino acid to the ribosome. So AAA should uh, encode lysine. And so it brings a lysine to the ribosome. The next one is GAU, and it will bring aspartic acid. So this ha happens, the ribosome moves along the RNA strand, adding the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one all brought to the ribosome by these tRNAs. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think the antibiotic that inhibits the ribosome, remember it's preventing protein synthesis, do you think it's likely to be bacteriostatic or bactericidal? Because it's a little bit of a trick question because the answer is it's both. Uh, so it depends on the antibiotic. They're usually actually bacteriostatic. And the reason is if you stop protein synthesis, as you just said, you stop everything, they're going to die eventually, but they're not going to die immediately. But then other antibiotics uh, can uh, mess up the ribosome and how it's making proteins. So instead of just stopping, it makes really messed up proteins. It puts random amino acids in there. And what that does is produces, quote unquote, bad proteins. And some of those end up in the membrane and can cause the cell to actually break open. So it's both is the real answer. Now I'll show you quickly a few examples of the type of uh, antibiotics that affect the ribosome. This one, you saw in the video at the very beginning, you had the mRNA, the two subunits of the ribosome, and the tRNA have to come all together. There is one antibiotic, or maybe more, but this one for sure, casugamycin that blocks this assembly. So this just stops all protein synthesis. And then if we look at what's called the elongation cycle, here you have a ribosome with the first tRNA, and then the next one comes in, and the peptide bond is made, it moves over, and then it starts over and over and over. There are antibiotics that affect all of these steps. For example, doxycycline prevents the tRNA from coming in. Chloramphenicol prevents the amino acid from being added to the growing chain, and spectinomycin prevents the tRNA from moving over, or the ribosome from moving over, and uh, making room for the next tRNA. So overall, there are more than 20 types of uh, antibiotics that affect the ribosome, 
they can bind directly to the smaller or large subunit of the ribosome or to factors that help in translation. Like those tRNAs have to be made and there are antibiotics that affect that as well. So another type of antibiotic can target metabolism. And that's shown here. There aren't very many of these. So in metabolism, you need to make certain things to the building blocks of cells. And one of those things is called tetrahydrofolic acid. Tetrahydrofolic acid is a cofactor for many essential uh, reactions in the cell. Trimethoprim and sulfonamide that block that pathway. So the cell starves for tetrahydrofolic acid. And this prevents growth, basically. Another target of antibiotics is the membrane. So we talked about cell wall before. Now I mean the actual membrane, the lipo, uh, sorry, the uh, lipid membrane. Polymyxins target the gram-negative bacteria and disrupt the membrane. They act like a detergent. If you add detergent to oil, you know it solubilizes it. Polymyxin works that way. And it only works on gram-negative because it binds to a specific uh, molecule called lipopolysaccharide. So last week, I simplified the membrane a little bit. Here is the inner membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane, with proteins in it. And then you have the peptidoglycan in the middle and the outer membrane in gram-negative bacteria. The outer membrane not only has proteins, it has something called lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide have a lipid part that is in the membrane and then a polysaccharide part that is sticking out. This is actually what can make you very sick uh, from, there's a toxic shock syndrome if you get an infection with E. coli or salmonella. This actually can cause a lot of the damage. Polymyxins bind to this molecule and then dissolve the membrane. So overall, antibiotics target processes that are important for the bacteria, but also our cells. For example, protein translation in the ribosome are essential for human cells as well as bacterial cells. I have another little question for you. Why do you think these antibiotics only make the bacterial cells die or stop growing and don't affect you? In other words, if you took an antibiotic that stopped protein synthesis, if it affected your cells, you'd be dead. How come you don't die? Some antibiotics target structures not present in human cells, as we said, for example, the cell wall. And the antibiotics that do target common structures, like the ribosome, uh, target proteins that are significantly different in humans than they are in bacteria. Okay, so now I want to move on to where do antibiotics come from? Well, in the case of penicillin, it's produced by a fungus, I told you last week. Other uh, antibiotics are produced by bacteria, many of them. Polymyxins in particular are made by gram-positive bacteria and target gram-negative bacteria. Streptomyces, which is a common soil bacteria, is thought to produce hundreds of different antibiotics. Actually, very few antibiotic classes or new types of antibiotics have been developed by chemists in the lab. Fluoroquinolones is an example. So a lot of the antibiotics produced by natural sources are modified by chemists to work better, but they're usually not the, discovered initially in the lab for various reasons. And you'll hear more about that in a few weeks when the medicinal chemist talks. So I just said polymyxins are produced by gram-positive bacteria and target gram-negative bacteria. And many of in streptomyces produces a lot of different antibiotics. Why? Why do you think this would be?
So protect themselves from, there could be predators, but also uh, food. There's competition for food in the environment. So they're often produced by bacteria, we think, to kill off the competition. If you kill off everything else, you get all the food, basically. So that's the simple answer. Although, again, uh, I should mention this is probably not the only answer. There's probably multiple reasons, but it's a big reason. All right, so what I just presented to you today and last week is this. It's a lot of information here, but I've gone through it already. So here's the cell indicating all the targets for antibiotics. Last week I talked about beta-lactams, which are penicillin, for example, that target the cell wall. I'll mention vancomycin in a little while that also affects the cell wall. I mentioned those that affect um, metabolism, those that affect DNA, those that affect RNA, and all of these are affecting the ribosome, protein synthesis, and polymyxins that affect the cell membrane. I think we'll break now before I go on to antibiotic resistance.